All right, so next up is the Prez 98. And he's. Wow. What? Did that do that? It should go back. It's, it's going through. Is it going through? Yeah. Oh, I did the wrong thing. Up, Dairy Queen Blizzard Cake. That's what that is. My talk is on. Uh, I'm going to talk about some legal arguments in a couple of recent legal cases involving um, Freedom of Information Act and surveillance and their impact on privacy. So before I talk about that, I want to talk a little bit about um, myself and what this presentation is about and what it's not about. Um, I work for Booz Allen. I'm a government contractor, um, the Pres 98 on Twitter. Uh, you may know me from uh, my award-winning, well, not really award, I haven't won any awards, but uh, I have a blog called Mike Log, and you may have seen uh, the posts I write called Law in Plain English, which is a, uh, thank you, um, which is, a, I write, I write uh, summaries of every Supreme Court case that comes down, uh, which is about 75 a year, and I also write on um, legal issues as they impact technology, such as uh, net neutrality and things like that. Uh, I was also nominated this year for one of the top 100 legal blogs on the internet, but I did not win. So, I was looking through someone's comment of my talk last year. I gave a talk at ChmooCon last year on uh, legal aspects of Microsoft's botnet takedowns. And one of the comments that I got was uh, that it was a sensationalist talk by, about the law by someone who wasn't a lawyer. And okay, I'm not a lawyer. And I make it clear in the beginning of my presentations, as I do on any time I talk about the law, is that I am not a lawyer. I am a law student, and I am not a lawyer, but hey, you know, whatever. So what's this talk about, and what is it not about? This talk's not about Edward Snowden, sorry. Uh, this talk is not about policy arguments or value judgments about the programs I'm going to talk about. Um, you, you can make those decisions yourself as part of the, uh, you know, citizens. This is a talk about comparing and, and contrasting legal arguments made in court cases and public cases um, in, in, in the last year or so. So this doesn't reflect, I'm going to talk about some of this, I'm going to talk about one program in particular that, that was related to something that Snowden released, but uh, in that sense, I'm talking purely from an uh, unclassified perspective and everything. I don't have anything to do with this stuff at, for what I do at work. Okay, got that out of the way. So first, first thing I'm going to talk, first, first legal argument is, is Freedom of Information Act. You, you probably know a little bit about it. Freedom of Information Act is a way that you can get information from the government. Typically, uh, you write them a letter uh, and you say, I would like to request information about myself or about something else. Uh, and then they'll write you a letter back eventually and they say, oh, there's nothing, or there's too much, or it's taking us too long, or, and they basically try to stonewall you for as long as possible so that you don't get anything. This guy's name's Ryan Shapiro, and he's an MIT researcher, and he is, according to the government, the most prolific Freedom of Information Act researcher in the country. Literally requests thousands and thousands of pages of documents, like voluminous requests. And what he, do, what he has found out that if he asks for information about an organization, um, a lot of that stuff will have people's names in it and they'll, they won't give it to him because they'll say that's oh, privacy or whatever. So what he has done is filed um, privacy waivers. So say for example, he wants to file for Freedom of Information to Act about the ACLU. He'll get a privacy waiver from the ACLU and then he'll file that with his request and then all of a sudden all these documents come. Well, Ryan Shapiro has filed so many requests that the government has now stopped fulfilling his requests under an argument that they call the mosaic theory of uh, under Freedom of Information Act law. And the idea he is here is that it, he's asking for so many documents that the, the government says, if we give you all of this stuff, you're going to start being able to put together a picture of what's going on, and this is going to threaten national security. And anytime you say national security, you know what's going to happen. So that's the argument that the government's making in that case. Now I want to go back for a little bit of history. In the late 1970s, there was a woman named uh, Patricia McDonough uh, who lived up in Baltimore, and she was robbed. And after she was robbed, she started getting a series of phone calls. And the phone calls were from someone who was taunting her about the robbery. And uh, 
And at one point, uh, the guy called her and said, uh, in 15 minutes, come out on your front step. And she did, and, and it was, the guy was there, and he ran off. And you know the police were a little concerned about this, so they went to the phone company, and they said, we'd like you to put a pen register on this phone line, or on her phone line, so we can tell who's calling her. Uh, and this is, a, this is an old pen register, but all a pen register does is it says, this number dialed this number. Who, who's calling her? It doesn't actually say if the call was completed. It doesn't actually say how long the call was. All it does is say who's calling her. And lo and behold, it, they found out that the guy who had robbed her was the guy who was calling her. Now, the police didn't have a warrant when they went to the phone company, but they did have him under, they did have an individual under investigation, and they did have probable cause. So there's something to be said about that. So that's Smith, Smith versus Maryland. It's a Supreme Court case decided in the 1970s, and it was a 5 3 decision. So one of the justices didn't participate. But so 5 3, you know, somewhat controversial decision. Now let's come to the telephone, uh, the intelligence community's telephone metadata collection. There's been two recent cases um, that have been decided about this program. The first is Clayman versus Obama, which was decided in the District of, uh, District of Columbia. Uh, and this, this program, or this decision said that the program is unconstitutional because it violated the Fourth Amendment. Um, and in a 180 degree decision in uh, the Southern District of New York, ACLU versus Clapper, the judge said, no, nope, this program is completely constitutional. There's no problems with it. And the government in both cases are basing their, their metadata collection on largely on Smith versus Maryland. So one person under investigation by the police called data to everybody, you know, that's, we can argue about whether or not that's a, whether that's a good analogy, but that's the analogy that they're making. I really would urge you to, to look at both of these cases, put them side by side, and you will not find a more 180 degree analysis of the same facts and the same cases and, and how two very intelligent judges can come to well-reasoned decisions about a program um, based on the same facts. Yes. Those were both decided in the last three months. Okay. So, the, uh, yeah, very recent cases. So the, D, the D.C. case uh, will, will get appealed to the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, which is a Court of Appeals. Um, so the, the government appealed that case. And there's a fair chance that it might get overturned. Um, the ACLU lost in, in New York, and they will appeal to the Second Circuit. Um, there's a fair chance that one or both of these cases could make their way to the Supreme Court, but it's possible that they won't either. So I want to talk a little bit about, we talked about the, uh, the um, mosaic theory as it applied to for the Freedom of Information Act. But it's very interesting because there's also a mosaic theory of the Fourth Amendment. Um, there is a, I'm not going to play this video, but there's a 20, 25 minute video on YouTube from, uh, from a guy named Matthew Cole called OPSEC Failures of Spies. I really urge you to bookmark this and watch it. It's very interesting. And what, what, um, what Matthew Cole talks about is how um, the Italian government was able to bust up a CIA operation in Italy solely by re relying on phone metadata. So they were able to look at phone metadata records and find that these 20 people were all talking to each other and only talking to each other. Uh, and based all on this metadata, they were able to uh, identify the names of a uh, majority of the CIA operatives, their actual real names, uh, and actually tried and uh, convicted a number of them in abstention. This is a couple of years ago. Um, and he also talks about several other instances where, where uh, governments, foreign governments, have used uh, metadata to co uh, compromise surveillance operations. So a couple of years ago, there was a case uh, in the Supreme Court called the United States versus Jones, uh, and the Supreme Court said GPS monitoring uh, was a search, and therefore the Fourth a a Amendment was applicable. Um, and while the court didn't decide the case on the mosaic theory, um, a number of the justices who, who'd agreed with the outcome of the case uh, thought that the mosaic theory was possibly applicable to the case. So it's something that's, the idea here now is that if you get enough metadata about someone, 
location data, phone records, all this sort of things, you can start to put revealing information about, about someone together. So for example, like we saw in the, in the, in the OPSEC failure of spies, we, they, the government, the Italian government was able to put enough uh, metadata together to identify people. So let's sort of review what we've talked about so far. In one case, the government says, we can't give you all of this data because if we give you all of this data, you're going to be able to figure things out, right? On the other hand, collection of mass amounts of legal data, or of metadata, and this is a quote from an uh, intelligence community lawyer, Obvious, obviously, there is no Fourth Amendment expectation of communication, ex expectation uh, of privacy in communications metadata. On the other hand, the potential for a large collection of metadata could create this mosaic uh, that would undermine personal privacy. So, you can see now where the title comes from. The government would like to not give you all this Freedom of Information Act data on one hand, but they would like to collect this information about you on the other hand. Now, maybe that's fair, maybe that's not, and it's not for me to stand up here and say it's right or wrong, but I think it's a troubling dichotomy, and I think it's worth having a discussion about. Um, so I am probably not quite done yet, but I am done. So thank you very much. And here's more cake. Like that.